In this screencast, I'm going to be looking at some of the boilerplate that's involved in writing a require.js application. If you're watching this, hopefully you have some experience already um, writing simple require applications. You know why you want to be using it and some of the advantages to using it. Um, but maybe you're like me and initially didn't quite understand the power um, and freedom that you're given with the module pattern uh, that uh, require.js uses. But because of the boilerplate, it may not be, and because of the documentation that they give you, it's maybe not initially obvious that you have this power and freedom. Um, this is what I'm talking, the, the, the documentation is incredibly clear and concise um, for, uh, f you know, for example, producing um, a simple enum. Um, this is this kind of pattern is common for for testing, or for even setting configuration patterns and configuration settings in your applications, in your own applications. But when you get to the actual uh, modules, this becomes this is a little bit too tightly packed for me. And when you unpack it, you begin to realize that there's a lot of freedom in there. And in fact, all you're really required, the only boilerplate that's required here is is this. Is, uh, is this wrapper, and then whatever you're returning. And in fact, this is common to everything that you'll see in uh, a required define, or you don't have to stick to just returning an anonymous function where everything is defined inside your anonymous function. You can do it any way that you want. Here I've got a simple application. Um, at this point, all it is is an index.html file. I'm loading require, and there's a main.js. And if we look at it right now, here's our uh, index.html, again, loading require. I'm loading our uh, main using data main. And here's our main, and right now it doesn't have anything in it. The boilerplate is actually incredibly simple and very similar uh, for both define and require. Define looks like this. Oops, sorry. Looks like this. We have a list of dependencies and we have a factory method that will return something. What it returns, that's up to you. Um, define is, at this point, very, very similar to require. Again, require, you're invoking a function. The uh, one argument is going to be your list of dependencies, and the next is going to be your factory method. If you list a dependency here, it gets loaded as an argument here, and you can do something with it. The difference between the two is typically your require isn't going to return anything, only your define is going to return uh, anything. So this is where you would load, let's say, application. And at this point, we actually can make the define into this, and this is the only difference uh, in the syntax of define and require. At this point, they're, they're functionally identical. I could also do the same thing here, which loads an application, and then returns something, does something with application, and then returns it. So we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. Define also takes an optional, and sometimes not so optional, argument at the beginning, which is the name. So we could, in fact, define application here. And whatever it returns here is going to be loaded as the dependency here. I've not tested this, but application is, is going to return 1, 2, 3 application gets loaded as a dependency and will alert and let's see if that works. Hey look at that it works. So this is one way now typically the way that you're going to write this is going to be with a module in here application.js. We don't have to name it because it's going to be the name is going to be uh, is going to be discovered automatically via the file name by require.js. At this point, we're loading a dependency called application. Application is in the lib folder in a file called application.js. 
The module name is application, not application.js. The module name is application, which is why we're using the name application here. And we should get the same thing. Yes. And you can see that after loading main, application gets resolved and executed. So there it is in the, uh, uh, in the network panel. All right. So there we are. We have, um, we're returning something. Well, application may, you may be wanting to return a, uh, a constructor. I'm going to be returning something called application. Well, application doesn't exist in this context, and it would have to exist in the global, which we don't want. So let's create one. Again, at this point, application can be anything. Right? It can be anything. But we want it to be a constructor. And we have application. Let's do a console. Right? So we are loading this. We are returning so we're loading this file. This file has, in its own scope, it has something called application. This could be called anything. It could be called that. It doesn't matter. This is within its own scope. But what I do is that. And this will return whatever. This will return the application constructor. And what we're going to do is we're going to execute it. And if we go back here, here we have an instance of application, and the ID is one two three, which is exactly exactly what we expected. So you'll notice here that well, we could say um, this to string is equal to function. Oops. That works. Three. We're invoking the toString method that's part of this. Now, application, there's probably going to be only one instance of this, but let's say that this is not application, but instead um, link, or um, uh, you have something that, that builds thousands and thousands and thousands of images. Um, when you have thousands and thousands and thousands of images, this you want to keep your constructor as tiny as possible. And so putting everything into your application kind of sucks. Why not put it into a prototype method? Just to prove that it's working. All right. It executes as well. So that's great. Um, I uh, I like that, but um, these are all public methods. They all all public properties. Sometimes I want to have some um, private. Maybe it's got some um, encryption. Now, of course, you can't use this. Uh, this will not be exposed here. We should, in fact, get a syntax error because salt is not defined. So we can only we can only use this as a public method. That kind of sucks. No. Well, because this is all being executed in its own scope, put it there. It works. So we've got prize. All of this is executing within its own scope. It's a nice little closure here. We have private um, uh, uh, private variables. We have public properties. 
we have public methods. And now we have a, uh, a private method. Um, let's do, uh, do private salt. And there we have that. Okay, so at this point now, I, I hope it's pretty obvious that since you are only required at this point uh, for require.js applications to provide this very, very simple boilerplate and return something from it, that you have total freedom to put anything that you want in here. I love this. I, I particularly like using this. I used to hate, I, I, I genuinely hate uh, prototype methods um, in uh, inline scripts uh, I've they tend to wander there's something really annoying about it that someone can a accidentally move a prototype method from one file to another and I've seen this in um, the first time I saw this was uh, in uh, phone gap in the phone gap code uh, that someone had moved a, a central prototype method into a completely unrelated file and it's it, it made the application behave almost like it was magic and uh, it I find it incredibly uh, um, annoying. But because all of this is being anchored in, if I move this into another uh, application, if I, uh, into another, um, into another uh, mo uh, module, I say I create a foo, right? So uh, let's, well, why don't we do this again? Define list of dependencies and our constructor. And let's say that we're going to take this and we're going to put it in there because we're idiots. Foo is equal to function. It's going to be constructor to foo. Application doesn't exist in this context. The scope is completely different. It only exists here. You, there are ways of extending the prototype of the application if, if the application is loaded as a dependency here then yes you can uh, but chances are it, if you're going to do it it requires a lot of planning to do it and it's less likely to be done by mistake so this I've started liking again and like I said this is my thing. This is this is the way that I write my applications, and I'm no longer bound by um, by this. And I love it. I find that there's a tremendous amount of freedom in writing applications um, this way. Things are uh, are loaded um, uh, as I need them. When I need them, I can drop a dependency, and and uh, it doesn't show up in the final code. There's no Bloat, there's no nothing. Uh, I can have shared libraries between applications. Require is awesome. And the fact that I can go back to writing my JavaScript in the way that I'm used to writing it, the way that I like it, and using the, um, the programming styles that I've developed over the last several years, what's not to love? This is, this is really, really awesome. So I don't know how you write your stuff. Um, I don't know how, um, you know, Everyone is everyone does their stuff their own way, um, but if you're using Require, relax, use the things, use the tools that you've built up over the years, uh, and uh, and have fun with it because you have freedom again. You're not just stuck with boilerplate that you don't um, that limits your choices. I hope this helps, and um, uh, there'll be more coming in uh, in the future. I'm going to try to do something on the. Um, uh, config, uh, and I'm also going to try to do something on uh, on testing because uh, that was a tough nut to crack. Uh, Require.js is uh, is quite difficult to uh, uh, to test with when you're mocking out dependencies, and uh, I think it will be useful to share that information too. That's coming up.